And we're back with Tiger Nut Podcast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm here with David Hood, who's had a pretty busy week with ACC Media Days. And David, we're, we're finally at that time where football is just around the corner. Yeah, we actually had Dabo's, you know, media outing over at the football facility last week on Tuesday. Then this Tuesday, we went up to Charlotte for the ACC, uh, you know, media days. And then a week from Friday is the first practice of fall camp, 4.30 on Friday afternoon, August the 4th. Clemson heads out there, and uh, we get the first practice in of the season. Uh, been seeing some pictures of the guys, videos of the guys have been putting in the the grind, and everybody says they're excited. And, uh, you know, they're, for people who like content, there will be a point there where we have availability 11 out of 13 days in the mid-August. So a lot of good, a lot of good content will be coming from that. And and you talked about, you know, seeing pictures and videos of guys who put in the work. And I think the guy that everyone's talking about is Xavier Thomas. I know he's posted some pictures on line and uh, he posted that he's at 10% body fat, which is he's never been that low before. And, and, I'm excited to see how the new retool Xavier Thomas is going to be this year. You know, we've been, we've been waiting since 2018, I guess it was, uh, you know, we first showed up, showed out, and then, you know, he's either been behind guys or has been hurt. You know, there's been a lot of COVID took over and just a lot going on with him. And, you know, one thing that Dabo said last week that I really like was some of these players, And I don't know if this has to do with a new trainer or a new system or whatever, but they're kind of taking more of a let's play the long game approach with injuries rather than, uh, you know, let's try and rush him back as soon as possible. You know, Trey Williams still coming back. We're not going to rush him. You know, that reminds me of my days covering the Atlanta Braves with Bobby Cox and somebody would strain a hamstring and the trainers would say, you know, hey, coach, we think he can go Monday. And Bobby would be like, okay. And he would say, all right, I'm going to give you one more day. And then there'll be an off day Tuesday, and we'll get you back in there Wednesday. And it kind of sounds like that's what they're trying to do. And maybe that'll, you know, be helpful for Xavier Thomas and his health. You know, I think we've talked just about the Clemson mentality for years has been kind of that slowly build and then peak at the right time and, and play your best ball going into the end of the season. And I think this kind of goes into that. It's you know, it's better to have guys 100% at – um. it's better to have them 100% in November than to have them at 80% in September. That's it. And, uh, you know, hopefully this approach starts to work. Clemson, you know, part of that run, 2016, 17, and 18, uh, not a lot of really, you know, no injuries really derailed the thing. Running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, defensive line, they kind of all stayed healthy and then – you know, since COVID, it's been a rash of injuries and people want to blame, you know, the strength and conditioning coaches and they want to blame everything else. But, um, you know, maybe this will be a turning point for this program and uh, maybe they'll start to get some luck on the health side again. Absolutely. It feels like just a team that's really had a lot of injury issues and that's really what's kept them out of the playoffs the last two years. Uh, you know, before media days got going, there was some big news that happened over the past few weeks. Uh, Chad Morris is back. Talk a little bit about that. How about the Chad is back? Yeah, Dabo kind of introduced it to the team, um, you know, after we had our media day with them. Um, and he was supposed to come back during the spring, according to Dabo. Uh, but he had a horse riding accident and broke his leg. Had to have several treatments and just wasn't able to come back. And then, you know, so part of the deal with him coming back, people, people have kind of a misconception about it. One of my friends texted me as soon as the news came out and was like, I just can't imagine this offense with both Garrett Riley and Chad Morris at the helm. That's not what's happening. This is Garrett Riley's offense. It's Kyle Richardson's offense. Chad is going to be an analyst, much like John Gross, former head coach at Jacksonville State. He's going to be looking a week ahead, two weeks ahead. Going to be helping out with both the offense and defense. And then on weekends, he's going to disappear and go watch his son Chandler play at TCU. So, Chad, you know, no no play calling, no game experience, you know, nothing like that. Uh, and he's cheap, Dabo said. He's a cheap quality hire. He's still getting paid by Arkansas through December 31st of this year. Uh, anything that he would make here would be, you know, that would offset what he's still making from Arkansas at the end of the 
the 10 million that they owed him. So I think he's either free volunteer or, you know, Dabo may dole him out like a candy bar every once in a while, but, but pretty cheap. And, you know, it's always good to have somebody on staff like that. That's kind of seen it all done at all. You know, it's funny that uh, me and a friend have this kind of running joke that Clipson's offensive struggles really began when uh, Terry Bowden left the staff and, and, you know, because he was in that kind of that role as a uh, as a volunteer coach for a few years. And and really, though, I mean, in serious, having guys who have that much experience around the game can only help you. I think, you know, yeah, he's not going to be calling plays. This is Garrett Riley's offense. That's what we want. That's what we're paying Garrett Riley big bucks for. But I, I really do like having Chad in the office as a sounding board. Yeah, it's not going to hurt anything. That's that's for sure. And, you know, and people forget, too. I mean, John Gross that's in there, The like I said, former – Jacksonville State head coach, man, that dude also knows offense. So you've got two quality guys who have been head coaches at a high level in that that office kind of doing this work. And I don't think they're going to get anything by those guys. And I, and I got to imagine, it's kind of been talked about too, that even though he's not on staff, I'm sure if Garrett Riley wants to pick Jeff Scott's brain on anything, I mean, Jeff would be more than happy to lend his opinions as well. Yeah, and, you know, it's so funny because people keep asking, when is Jeff coming back? Jeff is selling real estate right now. You know, he's uh, selling up at uh, Chocasi and I think the Cliffs and, and stuff like that. And he's finding out that he can not only make money, but he can be home at night for his kids. And so, yeah, I think if he, you know, was needed, he would be there. But right now, Jeff is uh, is happy being a husband and a dad and selling real estate. And as long as he's been in coaching and, and the crazy hours they have to put in, he does. I think he deserves some time to, to get to just enjoy time with his family. So I'm, I'm happy for him. I didn't realize he was selling real estate. So kind of the inverse of Dabo. Dabo sold real estate before coming to Clemson. So I well, guess it kind of reminds me there was a, you know, I, I was watching this, this, this thing about the old show, Leave It to Beaver, that came on back in the like late 50s and 60s. And Jerry Mathers, who played the Beaver, sold real estate in Los Angeles after the show was over and he was very successful. And he said, people love to buy real estate from the Beaver. Well, I sure feel around here would love to buy real estate from a guy that's got a couple of national championship rings on his hands. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, I mean, you probably at Lake Jacassi have old Clemson alums buying a retirement home and yeah, I mean, buying one from Jeff Scott, they're going to love that. Absolutely. So we'll talk now this week, it's media days and what was kind of the vibe at Media Day? Because there's a lot of talk that the ACC is probably about to go through some changes. Ooh, you know, yeah. So I, you know, talked to a lot of Florida State people when I arrived. And, uh, you know, Florida State has been very out there with their opinions. And, you know, they kind of uh, played the the part of the bratty kid in the room going into the ACC meetings, hey, we're going to kick and scream and try and get our way. Clemson has been on the quieter side, but the people at Florida State told me, you know, yes, absolutely. Uh, they are trying everything that they can to get out. And that there is kind of an important date coming up, August the 15th. August the 15th is the date that you have to inform the ACC in writing that you intend to leave by the following June. And if you don't, then you have to wait another 22 months. Why is this important? Well, I got to the ACC kickoff, and uh, someone from from TV told me, "Hey, it doesn't you know affect you at all, but get ready. Colorado is getting ready to move from uh, the the Pac-12 to the Big 12. Kind of been hearing that's going to happen for months. What kind of surprised me was the timing that Colorado will play in the Pac-12 this year. By the way, Pac-12 still has no media rights deal." And then they will be in the Big 12 next year. Remember, Oklahoma and Texas seems like they've been headed to the SEC for a decade, but they had to wait four or five years or whatever it is. And, and UCLA and USC going to the Big 10, having to wait. Colorado not waiting, going next year. And why that's important is because the TV networks are trying to line up these conferences for the start of the 12-team playoff. They would love to have a lot of this conference stuff settled. And the TV is what's kind of driving all this. So that's that would be important. You know, a team would say, hey, ACC, guess what? Next June, we're out of here. And that way we can start playing in another conference if, if it's going to happen. Uh, otherwise, they've got to wait 22 months. Now, 
you know, the end is, you know, what's not said and all that is that you've got to have an invite. You can't just say, hey, we're going to leave, right? You got to have somebody that's willing to take you. Is it the Big Ten? Is it the SEC? Could it be the Big 12? We just don't know. I just know that it's really kind of all quiet on Clemson's end right now. <clears throat> and uh, usually when it's all quiet, things happen. So, and I don't know that anything's going on, but it, it really is kind of quiet around here. And, uh, you know, hopefully once we kind of get into August and camp and can talk to people, we may have a little bit of a, of a different opinion on things. But, uh, you know, I would love to see if, if Florida State does, uh, you know, notify the ACC they intend to leave. You know, could the Big 12 be a partner? Absolutely. Uh, could the Big 10 be a partner? Absolutely. Could the SEC? Maybe. Um, and, you know, hearing people talk about ACC could expand to UConn or App State or East Carolina. Dude, you can't let the SEC add Oklahoma and Texas. Can't let Big Ten add USC and UCLA and you go add freaking UConn. That's a disaster waiting to happen. That is the fast train to nobody knowing who you are anymore. If I'm Clemson, I'm Florida State, that terrifies me. I would think if the ACC adds UConn, you're pretty much saying this is a basketball first conference. I mean, that's that's what that says to me. Yeah, that's the give up signal. That's it. That you know, we're done. Uh, we all kind of know that this is going to break off into a top 32, 30, you know, 8, 42, 44, 64 team deal anyway in a few years. But I think that the, uh, um, you know, the first bells will begin to fall pretty soon. And, you know, for, for Clemson fans, it's definitely something we're going to watch. But it's – it's we're in the, the catburger seat, so to speak, with this because, I mean, Clemson right now is – the brand's never been better. Um, a lot of conferences would definitely be interested in adding. I know for the Big Ten, they would love to be able to expand into the South. I think that there's a lot of benefits. But you look at programs like a Georgia Tech or a Wake Forest or a Duke, I mean, what, what where could they end up? Yeah, probably uh, wishing that they were on the inside looking out rather than outside looking in. You know, Georgia Tech is attractive. Atlanta market, so you'd be attractive to the Big Ten, right? Atlanta market, great recruiting area, fertile recruiting ground. It would add to the Big Ten's, you know, kind of footprint down there. <clears throat> and then giving you those TV eyes, which, you know, I think we've discussed it before. Let's just say that um, – you know, uh, let's look at the state of Tennessee, right? So state of Tennessee, you have, um, you know, well, we'll look at Georgia. So no big team in Georgia, right? So right now, if you have direct TV and you have the Big Ten Network, the Big Ten's paying direct TV, 10 cents for every TV that they're connected to in the state of Georgia. Not a lot, right? But then if you add, um, you know, a Georgia Tech to the Big Ten, then all of a sudden they're paying like $3 per TV. It's a lot of money. All of a sudden, the conference goes, hey, man, we're making a lot more money now out of the state of Georgia. And they add North Carolina. I think that's where a lot, you know, we're all about streaming and, you know, how many people can you get in front of right now? So, uh, you know, for people that look at, you know, the brand, what do they bring to it? And you got to look at the TV part of it, too. Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, I remember years ago being kind of, you know, people were confused. Why did the Big Ten add Rutgers? New York. They were in the New York market. I mean, that's and that's, you know, with Georgia Tech, they bring even better than that because they've, they've got a little bit better tradition in football. They've got great academics. They have a lot that they would fit well with the Big Ten. But, but at the end of the day, you're right. They bring that Atlanta market, which is huge. So I think it's uh, it's going to be fun. Let's, you know, let's see what happens maybe in the next two weeks or so. And, you know, maybe we'll have some more answers after that. But right now. You know, just excited the fact that we were able to talk to, you know, all of Clemson's assistant coaches last week, able to talk to Davo Sweeney, Kate Klubnick, uh, you know, Tyler Davis and uh, Will Putnam yesterday. Again, that was a lot of fun, man. Some great stories came out of there. You know, a uh, conversation that I have with Kate Klubnick. How many people know that he has a brother that played college football at Yale? Great story that comes out of that, and I'll go ahead and tell it here. So his brother played at Austin Westlake, right? Uh, goes on, has 15 or so offers, but decides to play football at Yale. Is, you know, one of the best wide receivers to ever go through Yale. Puts up 1,000-yard seasons, man, as a stud. Kate says he was my hero. 
paid, attended a lot of games at Yale. And I said, well, with a brother as a wide receiver, you know, did you always grow up wanting to be a quarterback or were you ever going to be a wide receiver? And he said, I've always been a quarterback. He said, but true story, my brother was a quarterback at Austin Westlake. He said, but then this dude came in the program by the name of Sam Ellinger and my brother had to become a wide receiver. He's like, cause that Ellinger kid is pretty good. And I'm like, yeah, I can see that. So uh, just some great stories, you know, hearing that Cade Klubnick took, um, uh, you know, all of his offensive linemen out on a party bus <laughs> from Clemson, took them to Sobeys in Greenville, took them for a night out on the town, a lot of bonding. Will Putnam said it was great. Like he's put it up on the schedule and it was actually all of the quarterbacks that took all of the offensive linemen out. They have the party bus, they go to Sobeys. Uh, they have a good night. And he said, you know, it's one of those things that because you're in different meeting rooms, you know, maybe that freshman offensive lineman doesn't know Kate Klubnick or Paul Tyson or Hunter Helms. And we don't ever really get to hang out together. Well, they got to hang out together. Uh, Tyler Davis talking about a defensive line retreat that was really good. So a lot of great stories coming out of, you know, that ACC kickoff, Dabo telling stories as he always does, doing magic tricks with Kelsey Riggs. I mean, you saw that it was, and it's so Dabo because it can't be one of those magic tricks that goes like 30 seconds. You know, it took like nine minutes for that trick to unfold. Funny stuff. Um, but really where we got the most info was at Dabo's media gate media day last week in the indoor facility. We got to go in and take pictures in the, you know, the big room and all of that, but getting to talk to each position coach and me learning a little bit more about each position group, so valuable as we head into the into the season. Seems to me, and not to say Dabo ever quits having fun because that's that's his thing, but he really is having some fun again. I mean, the, you got the magic tricks at Media Day, and all, this offseason, him and uh, I believe Clay went to the Phoenix Suns, one of the playoff games, and he just he seems to be kind of doing some of those again. And I feel like that's when he and Clemson are at their best when he's kind of cutting loose and having some fun with it. So it's exciting to see that. It's exciting to see him still be the same Dabo all these years later. Yeah, yeah. It, I even posted, I think, a picture of him when he sat down uh, to the to the table uh, at, at his media day and was like, he's in a good mood. When he's in a good mood, that means good things are usually about to happen. And, you know, let, let's talk about this for a second. If there was one position group that you were worried about, what would it be? Wide receiver. Okay. That's that's everybody, right? Like we all know. Why does wide receiver worry you? Uh just a lot of unknown. And you know, the some of the guys we've had have had injuries. Bo Collins is a guy that I think has all the potential in the world, just hasn't always been healthy. And I think same with Adam Randall. So with with all of that said, and you were absolutely 100% spot on there, you know, in, in talking to a lot of the offensive coaches and they were like, why are you worried? And I told them those things. And, you know, some of the answers that I got really made, made me feel better. And one of them is, let's face it, Clemson's offense has forever and a day since Chad Morris left. We're better than you across the board at every position, right? We're going to go get these big wide receivers. We're going to put them on the boundary side of the field. So if you don't know what that means, that means you've got two hashes, right? So if it's on the right hash, that wide receiver is going to be on the sideline closest to that hash. The other side is called the field. So Clemson would always line up a wide receiver. Yes, I've got bronchitis. Uh, but Clemson would always line up a wide receiver on that boundary side, put him one-on-one with the corner and throw up a 50-50 ball. That was the offense, right? We're also going to run it some. A lot of times the routes would maybe be two guys that are, you know, maybe four guys are on the route, but only two are hot. Um, the middle of the field, not really open at times. Just, you know, I heard that, uh, you know, Hunter Renfro was over at Dabo's house this summer and was talking about the Garrett Riley hire and said, man, you guys never gave me a target in five years. You know, I was always just kind of the decoy and then you guys would throw it to me on third down. Like, that's what I did. And it's interesting to hear that, you know, hey, maybe the slot's going to be a target. So this, you know, this coach told me uh, that's not necessary anymore. Players are going to play either one side of the line or the other. You're going to be a, a wide receiver on the right side of the line or the left side. Not going to be flipping and flopping. Um, everybody's going to be hot. 
Uh, quarterbacks, wide receivers can make adjustments to the line of scrimmage. Uh, talked to somebody last week that, um, you know, said uh, early in, you know, fall or early in spring practice, uh, they, they had a play where everybody kind of rolled left, running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, offensive line. And then two plays later came back with that play, tried to run it again. Everybody on the defense went left and he threw it back to a running back for like a 65 yard touchdown because he's now snuck out. Right. And it's that type of thing that Clemson's been missing, man, getting talented guys in open space. And so they say, yes, they think that Adam Randall can be that nine man type big wide receiver. They think Bo Collins can do it. They've got to be healthy, but it's not a necessity in this offense. And then you've also got that cat that's six, seven, 240 pounds by the name of Jake Brenningstool, who's going to be an absolute nightmare in this offense. Brenning still, I mean, to me, feels like probably the best tight end Clemson's had since Jordan Leggett. I mean, that was, and, and Leggett was such a factor in the sense that he almost was like a big wide receiver. I mean, Clemson would split him out wide. They would do a little bit of everything with him. And I'm excited to see how uh, Garrett Riley can utilize Burning Stool this year. Yeah, I saw him the other day. And I said, have you grown even more? I mean, <laughs> you know, and I asked. Kay Klubnick that yesterday. I know Kate's put on weight. Kay looked taller to me. I'm like, man, these dudes are looking fantastic. But can you imagine that, you know, you're a, a you know, you're a six foot one safety or six foot two linebacker, and you see this guy that's six foot seven, 235 pounds, 340 pounds, and runs like a deer. You got to go cover him down the field. Yeah, good luck with that. Fun to see these guys get to grow up. One thing that I think uh, came out there in Dabo's media day uh, that kind of surprised some people, the plan is to redshirt uh, Vizina is, instead of having him as quarterback number two. What uh, What's your thoughts on that? I think that that is a great plan. You know, so they had some, some quarterback targets for the 2024 20, recruiting class that kind of fell through, right? So now if you redshirt Vizina, you do not feel like you have to take a quarterback in the 2024 class. You've already got one for 2025 in Blake Hebert. Yes, it's not a bear like Bobby A. Bear that used to play for the Saints. It's Hebert out of uh, out of Massachusetts. Really good quarterback. They're high on him. So now they kind of feel like Christopher Vizina is that 2024 guy. And you can can redshirt him. Hunter Helms will take all the snaps, but you can still play him in four games, right? Like he can still go out there. He can still get action. You know, I don't know, is that going to happen against Charleston Southern or whoever, you know, Florida Atlantic? I don't know. Uh, would it happen later in the season if they got a chance? Maybe. A lot of tough games late, but, uh, you know, he'll get a chance to play. And my only caveat on that would be, I think, this is me, I think if K. Klubnick were to get hurt and it was serious enough, he would miss several games. And, of course, that red shirt's going to come off of Zena. That was going to be my next question is, you know, is because I think I agree. I think red shirting him is is the best decision. I think that gives you that quarterback for the future. I, I like it, but I think there's always that concern of, OK, what if we need him? And, you know, I I, I think I think at that point you've got to look. It's like at that point, it's, it's just got to be open competition. I, I don't necessarily think that Hunter Helms would be a bad option if if. Club that got hurt. I think Helms has done a lot to earn himself this, this opportunity. You know, Hunter's a kid that, that again, you know, we talked about this before. He could have gone somewhere else. He could have gone somewhere else and contended for a starting job. He knows what his job is here. He loves Clemson, loves being here. Uh, there was even the possibility in the spring that, you know, that was like, hey, you know, if we don't have some attrition somewhere, I may have to take Hunter's scholarship away from him. But Hunter stayed, and, you know, he's proven to be very capable. And as long as, you know, again, you know, I don't know if you want to head into the teeth of the schedule and say that's the guy, because we haven't ever seen him a lot, you know, so we don't know. <laughs> Excuse me, bronchitis. But they they feel comfortable with him. That's all I need to know. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And I think, you know, as we talked about with the weapons around him, I mean, I think the offense is going to change if club nicks out, no matter if it's Vizina or – Hunter Helms, it's going to be very run heavy, and but I I, I do think Hunter is definitely could, could be fine in that role if needed. Hopefully, it's not even a thing we have to worry about. Um, but it definitely just was interesting to see that kind of come out. 
But yeah, it, I mean, happy for Hunter Helms. He's, you know, was definitely a little bit concerned that he might lose his scholarship, but I'm, I'm glad that he didn't. So yeah, you know, with Hunter Helms, there was a lot of talk about him maybe having to lose his scholarship. And there's been a lot of hand wringing from Clemson fans and Clemson in general over the over the offseason with the fear of, you know, going into the season over 85. But it looks like everything's going to be fine now that uh, Clemson got the news about TJ Dudley. Yeah, TJ Dudley did did, you know, betray the trust of his locker room. Kind of we'll leave it at that. Um, uh, you know, I think that um you know, from what I've heard, it was the seniors that voted that he kind of be dismissed after that betrayal. And uh, so, yeah, Dabo came in and said that they were at 84, so he can put one of the holders, or excuse me, the long snappers back on scholarship, be at 85 heading into the season. So, um, uh, yeah, good news on the scholarship front, sort of bad news, and that you lose a linebacker that <clears throat> you really had high hopes for. And you had hopes that he was going to play and provide some depth. But, you know, when talking to Wes Goodwin the other day, it sounds like he's going to play a lot of four-two-five anyway. Uh, play two linebackers. Wade Woodaz will kind of play that extra safety guy, you know, Swiss Army knife. So we'll see how that all works out. Just means some of these younger guys, D. Creighton, who looks like he's ready to play today, Jamal Anderson, they're probably going to have to play some snaps this year. Yeah, I think it will be – you know, exciting to see some of these young guys go and definitely hate that everything happened with, with Dudley, but it's kind of as part of the the sport of college football and you kind of you move on and and go from there. You know, earlier we were talking a little bit about TV and, and you mentioned that the Pac-12 still doesn't have a media deal. Uh, part of the reason is because the ACC has a new media deal with the CW. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so you'll be on the same channel as the Gilmore Gil girls, you know, woohoo. Uh, it's funny, I asked ACC Commissioner Jim Phillips Tuesday, what can you do to try and keep Clemson and Florida State happy? Because there's a big gap between, you know, 40 and 42 million and 90 million, right? Like there's a big gap. What can you do? Well, we've got some deals coming up. Can you talk about them? No. But we did sign with the CW, which gives us increased visibility. So great. You know, it puts you on more TVs. You know, everybody pretty much in the Southeast should have some kind of access to CW. Might make Clemson fans a little happy. But, you know, in, in terms of the money brought in, you know, not going to be the, the thing that keeps Clemson or Florida State in the ACC. Helps a little bit. Helps with the visibility and letting people see the games, you know, for sure. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, not a game changer for them. Yeah, that was my first thought was just that, hey, at least it gets the games back on TV. I mean, for Clemson fans, it hadn't been as big a deal for football because we hadn't really been on the Raycom game in, in what seems like forever. But uh, for basketball, I know it had been an issue. So definitely nice to be able to to have that more accessible and kind of uh, kind of fun, kind of like the return of Jefferson Pilot Sports. Hey, yeah, Mike Hogwood. Remember Mike Hogwood? Yeah, yeah, Doc, Doc Walker and, and and all of them. Love Doc Walker. Yeah, those were the good old days. Every game started at 1 o'clock. You run, you know, Raycom, Jefferson Pilot. Um, didn't have to worry about streaming or anything like that. Big Mike Hogwood down there on the sidelines sweating his butt off. Uh, those days are, are long gone. You know, but another piece of news kind of coming out of that is that the ACC Network, <laughs> a lot of what the SEC Network does is sending their – ACC huddle crew on the road. They are going to go on the road all of August to go to each one of the ACC schools, and then every week they will be at a game. I talked to Eric McClain at the ACC kickoff yesterday. I said, where are you going to be that opening weekend? And he just laughed, and he said, we're going to be all over the place because the, I think the a ACC plays Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Monday. And, you know, that Monday game might be of importance to people because it's going to be at Duke. And it involves Clemson and the Blue Devils on uh, Monday night on ESPN. That'll be exciting. That'll be that'll be fun to have kind of the ACC pregame show to watch that day, since you know, there isn't game day on the Monday. So definitely a a lot of cool stuff with that. That's that's really exciting to see. Yeah, you know, and and uh, you know, kind of having Clemson and Duke is the only game in town to cap off that big opening weekend. You know, it's funny though. You, you talk to the Clemson coaches and players, not exactly thrilled with this arrangement because if you think about it. Um, you know, Clemson, let, let's just say that we are all extremely fortunate and that game ends by midnight. 
post game interviews, pack up the bus, get everybody a shower, get them some food, get them on the bus, get them to the airport by 145, lift off at two. We get them back into Greenville by 2.15, unload the plane, pack up the bus by 3, get everybody packed to club some by 4, 4.30. And guess what? You know, all of a sudden it's 5 a.m. Tuesday morning and you've got a game in three and a half days. This Not cool. Two years in a row, Clemson's had to deal with this as well. Did Had it last year with the Georgia Tech game. And, and yeah, it's it's a tough turnaround. I mean, that's – that's the negative of play in the Monday night game. Is it absolutely is a is a very rough turnaround for the for a team? Yeah, and you get somebody that you know sprains an ankle a little bit or you know does something like that. Man, it, it'll be tough on them. It really will. And you know, I guess you're fortunate that it's Charleston Southern and Florida Atlantic in back to back weeks after that. So maybe you can rest some guys if you need to. But yeah, that's a tough turnaround. It really is. Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely uh, definitely one of the things that you know will be interesting to look for. I imagine we might see a little bit of a slow start in that Charleston Southern game just because of that. I guess my last question I really have before we get out of here is is one that comes up every off season and, and it's kind of become the norm in college football. Do you think we will ever see alcohol sales in Death Valley? Ooh, you know, it's funny. So there were you know reports. I mean, it's great that you say that, you know, that maybe the, the Clemson Board of Trustees people were talking about it. Uh, but I have been told no active discussions at this time. Uh, but as we get into this big NIL world and as we get into this big, you know, hey, who's going to outspend who? Clemson's got that lot five they're redoing. Uh, you know, yeah, I think at some point it will happen. <laughs> will that be in the next five years, 10 years? You know, Clemson is one of the unique places. I don't sell alcohol. It's still more of a family event than it is, you know, trying to invite a bunch of drunks in. Uh, I guess, you know, it's probably one way to put it. But people can still drink at their tailgate. People can still try to sneak booze in. So I don't know how much of a you know big difference it makes. But Clemson has always been, you know, really unique. And let's try and keep that family atmosphere around. But I do think eventually it will happen. Yeah, and to that point, some of the schools that have begun selling have noted that they've actually had less incidents in the stadium. So there may be something to that. I just I was curious on that because it seems like a lot of the contemporary schools are doing it. South Carolina does it, Georgia Tech does it. Uh, you know, I think really the two that are kind of kind of the big holdouts, funny enough, are Clemson and UGA. And so I, I just I always wonder when when that when that first day that we're gonna see that. Cause I because it's it's Going to happen eventually, I feel like. Yeah, Georgia Tech and South Carolina have to give their fans something to numb the pain by the third quarter. Uh, it's, you know, not pretty a lot of the time. So that's just – I'm just being funny, people. Don't don't get offended. <laughs> um, just a little sports humor to get the season started. Absolutely. Yeah, I, guess, I guess that's it, too, when Clemson has a better product. It's – it's uh, they don't need to numb it as much. And also, I, I do always wonder, too, if they start selling in the stadium, are they going to take away the ability to reenter the game? Because that's a that's a big part of for a lot of people's game day is at halftime they go out to their tailgate and get a few drinks in. They get sauced up, don't they? They, they do. Happens. do. Uh, you know, I know people that uh, – I have a real good friend. Well, I won't out him here, but uh, he's famous for, man, I can't wait for this game. Then, you know, I text him in the third quarter, and I'm like, where are you? And his wife's like, dad, nah, he's in the back of the truck. He's he's gone. He, I'll wake him up when we get home. <laughs> I've known a few different Clemson fans kind of like that. 